So in today's lesson, we're going to be talking about industrial stoichiometry, so calculations involving reactions happening at the industrial level. And so I want to ask you, what would you expect to be different if we are conducting experiments on the industrial scale versus in a laboratory, say, for instance, a small laboratory, like a high school laboratory or a university laboratory? Uh, so just think about, well, what is what is different, right? And so I'm hoping when you think about that, that um, you think about the fact that you're going to be using large, large amounts of materials, right? And so we're not going to be working in grams or milligrams. We're going to be working in very large quantities like kilograms and tons and so on. Because typically we want to mass produce a particular product using some raw materials. And so some convenient uh, unit conversion factors are are these. So here we go. So a kilogram is a thousand grams. I think most of you are probably familiar with that one, and it comes up a lot. Uh, we're also going to talk about a ton. A metric ton is a thousand kilograms. So we take a thousand kilogram, a thousand grams in a kilogram, and a thousand kilograms in a ton. That will give us ten to the power of six grams. Um, so those will come in handy, um, and I would encourage you to convert to grams. Uh, when working with formulas rather than to, than to convert molar masses to different units. So often we're going to see a couple of two or more steps in reactions. So for example, we might need to take raw materials and produce a primary product and then use that primary product to produce, produce a second product. And that is really what we're looking to make is that second final product. Um, so that we'll see. Um, another thing is, is that remember that in, in industrial chemistry, we're often using raw materials. And so those raw materials, those reactants are given as a percentage of the whole, right? So um, for example, uh, I like to think about like sand, for instance, we know we can use silicon dioxide to make um, materials like glass. Um, well, if we're collecting the raw sand, right, um, we might have a thousand kilograms of it or a ton of sand, and it's containing 30% silicon dioxide. So not all of that sand uh, is 100% silicon dioxide, but we probably know from sampling it what we can expect on average, the in what should be contained of silicon dioxide in the average sample that we collect. So it's important to remember that when we write out our chemical reaction, because we should do that when we're doing stoichiometry problems, that we're going to have silicon dioxide here, maybe another reactant or so, and then eventually a product. But when we're, when we're predicting the amount of product we make, we need to understand that we don't, in fact, have 1,000 kilograms of silicon dioxide. We only have 30% of 1,000 kilograms or 300 kilograms, right? And so we're gonna use that amount in order to do our calculations with these chemical reactions, right? That whole big pile of raw material is not going to be entirely silicon dioxide. So we need to account for that when we're doing our stoichiometry problems. Okay, so let's take a look at one example to get us started. And so often the wording of these questions tends to be the most, the biggest struggle for students. And so by um, practicing, you'll get a sense of how questions are worded and how to interpret the information in these questions. Um, all right, so in this one, we've got zinc metal, okay, uh, obtained by a two-step process shown below. So here is step number one, and here is step number two. And so um, via the two-step process shown below, how many grams of zinc, okay, so let's locate our zinc, can be obtained from zinc sulfide ore? Okay, so let me give you some context here. We would have um, pulled out some raw zinc from, uh, so some zinc sulfide ore from the ground, and uh, but it's not pure zinc. And so uh, presumably it either is too energetically costly or too costly in other ways or not and not feasible to produce zinc from zinc sulfide directly and so we first need to oxidize it producing zinc oxide and then that zinc oxide from our first step gets uh, becomes a, pr a reactant in our second step so then we can you know add it to some carbon and then get our pure zinc which is really that product that we're looking to get to extract um, all right and so in this question um, we are given the amount of zinc sulfide and we are asked to predict the amount of zinc and so 
Uh, one thing you might have noticed that I didn't make it evident like right away, but I think is worth noting is that notice that we've got right here these coefficients in the balanced chemical equation that are strangely kind of related here. So uh, I've got, let me just get rid of that for a second here. Um, so, I've, you know, why would I, I normally wouldn't include a two to two to two to two ratio here, right? I would just lower that to put that in lowest terms. But I've done that because if we look in the first equation, I can see that there is a two to two uh, mole ratio between um, the reactant zinc sulfide and the product from that first step that becomes the reactant in the second step. And so if I align those coefficients, my life can be really easy, easy. And the reason for that being that if I know, for instance, let's say I do the math and I find out I have five moles of zinc sulfide, because of the one-to-one -one ratio, I have five moles of zinc oxide, five moles of zinc oxide, and then five moles, therefore, of zinc, because these are all in a one, two to two to two to two relationship or one to one to one to one ratio. Um, so now I don't have five moles. I have a different amount, but the, the logic still holds true for the amount of moles that I eventually figure out that I have for zinc sulfide. Um, and so uh, instead of kind of doing a multi-step approach here, I can just simply go from the moles of zinc sulfide directly to my zinc. And logic also should tell you that in this case, every zinc atom I eventually kind of isolate is coming from zinc sulfide. And for every one particle of zinc sulfide, I have one atom of zinc that is liberated. So regardless, that, you know, that should make sense. So let's get started. So just to, in, in any stoichiometry problem, it makes sense for us to start by converting to moles, right? Um, but I'm going to want to make sure that I change those kilograms into, uh, I change them into grams. So if I have 200 kilograms and uh, I want to convert that to grams, I know that for one kilogram, I have a thousand grams. And so uh, when I work that out, that's going to give me a value of 2.000 times 10 to the power of 5 grams if I write that in scientific notation. Uh, right, so there we go. So I started off with that. Now, because I know the formula of the substance that I'm working with, that zinc sulfide, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to convert that into moles. So I know the moles of zinc sulfide are going to be equal to the mass of that zinc sulfide that I have divided by the molar mass of that substance. Right, and so the mass of zinc sulfide is, is that 2.000 times 10 to the power of 5 grams divided by um, when I combine the molar masses of zinc and sulfur I get a value uh, from my periodic table of 97.47 grams per mole though your periodic table might have slightly different values which may account for some differences there but it shouldn't be too too much um, and so when I work that out I get a value for my zinc sulfide uh, my moles of zinc sulfide as uh, 2,051 point something something. I'm, I'm going to round that to 2,052 moles. And let's just do a sig fig analysis. This 200 gram, kilograms has four sig figs. And so I need to make sure I conserve that here in my uh, result for moles. Uh, okay, so the next thing that I need to do is now that I know uh, I want to look at my ratio here. And so my ratio of zinc sulfide to zinc is one to one, right? I know my ratio is one to one. And, and so I can say, all right, well, since my ratio is one to one, that must mean that my moles of zinc sulfide are the same as the number of moles of zinc, just like we looked at at the very beginning. Um, if I wanted to show that as a calculation, I would go, I would use dimensional analysis and just go 2052 moles of zinc sulfide but I know that there is one mole of zinc, I'm running out of real estate, divided by for every one mole of zinc sulfide, right? So if it's a one-to-one -one ratio, I definitely have 2,052 moles of zinc as well. And so you probably are predicting the next step if you have some uh, basic knowledge of stoichiometry. Step number four is, of course, going to get us back to a value in grams. So we're going to convert to grams. So I know that the mass of zinc is going to be equal to the number of moles. 
2.052 moles of zinc times its molar mass of 65.38 grams per mole, um, giving me a value of uh, 134,000, huge, right? Um, 210 grams. And that's, of course, only to the five, the four sig figs that I'm trying to convert, uh, uh, trying to have here. Sorry, that should be a zero. Um, but again, my question, the question asked for that value in kilograms. And so dividing by a thousand is going to give me 134.2 kilograms. So there we go. Um, so hopefully you found that to be okay. Uh, again, it's just recognizing the coefficients in the balanced chemical equation and converting um, from kilograms or possibly tons into grams. Uh, okay, let's look at another question. So let's read through it first and then we'll try to tackle it. So the example reads, the following reaction is used in an industrial process for making sodium sulfate. So let's identify where that is. I find it's just good to stop and take stock of what you have. So where is sodium sulfate? That is this, okay? And so we're trying to, in the industrial process we're looking at is making sodium sulfate. This process uses salt cake. Okay, and well, what is salt cake? Salt, salt cake is 88% pure sodium chloride. Okay, so where's sodium chloride? It's in our formula, but notice that salt cake isn't, right? We're not reacting salt cake, we're reacting the sodium chloride in the salt cake. Okay, so that process produces the sodium sulfate that is basically 96% pure, okay? How many tons of the industrial grade sodium sulfate will be produced from 2.75 tons of salt cake. Okay, so let's look at this question. So the first thing we always want to take care of when we look at a chemical reaction is to identify whether it's balanced. And this one doesn't happen to be balanced. And so I'm going to go ahead and do that. So um, if you're interested in knowing how to balance, that would be a separate lesson, and I encourage you to uh, take a look at one of my videos for that. Um, so now, I can, uh, now that I've balanced my chemical reaction, um, I can start. And so um, my first step would be to kind of organize the amount of sodium chloride that I have to start with, right? And so they're telling me that I have at the onset 2.75 tons. Um, you know, but that's 2.75 tons of the impure salt cake, right? So, you know, I have that many tons of salt cake, um, but I know that that is only 88% pure. And so um, I can multiply that by 0 0.88, and that's going to give me the number of tons of pure NaCl that I have, right? So, and that value happens to be, when I do that work, is 2.42 tons. Now, um, I'm going to want to go ahead and take that value and uh, convert that into grams. And when I multiply by 2, uh, by 10 to the power of 6, uh, two, I get 2.42 times 10 to the power of 6 grams. And that's just a straight up unit conversion. Uh, so that tells me the amount of sodium chloride here that I'm starting with, the 2.42 times 10 to the power of 6 grams. Um, okay, so now that I have that, um, I can go ahead and I can convert that into a, a mole value. Because, of course, those coefficients in my balanced chemical equation, I can only relate if I have converted to moles. Okay, mo those coefficients mean mole. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. So the number of moles that I have of sodium chloride is going to be equal to its mass in grams, so 2.42 times 10 to the power of 6 grams, divided by its molar mass. And so when I look at the molar mass of sodium and chlorine on my periodic table, uh, I see that they add up to a value of 58.44 grams per mole. And of course, that might vary slightly depending on your, your periodic table, how old it is, and so on and so forth. Uh, so when I work that calculation out, I get a 4.14 times 10 to the power of 4 moles. And that's moles of sodium chloride. Okay, so that's where I am. So now I'm ready to say, well, I know that for every 2 moles of sodium chloride that I use, 
I am making one mole of sodium sulfate. So I'm going to do my mole ratio next and sort all that business out. And of course, you could consolidate all of this into a single step using dimensional analysis. And that is entirely up to you, uh, depending on your comfort level. So I know that I have 4.14 times 10 to the power of 4 moles of my sodium chloride. But I don't want sodium chloride, I want sodium sulfate. But the chem balanced chemical equation tells me that I have 2 sodium chlorides for every 1 sodium sulfate. 2 sodium chlorides for every 1 sodium sulfate. Look at how nicely these units cancel. right? And that's going to give me half, right? Basically half of that. So I could do the mental math here and know that I'm making 2.07 times 10 to the power of 4 uh, moles of sodium sulfate. Or I can do the math using my calculator, whatever works for you and your comfort level. So now at this point, I have the number of moles of sodium sulfate. Um, but of course, I want to know ma my value in, in uh, tons. So I'm working my way up to that. So my next step is going to be convert into mass. The mass of sodium sulfate is going to be the number of moles I just mentioned that we just figured out times the molar mass of sodium sulfate. So adding up the individual atomic masses of each, uh, I am, from my periodic table, I'm getting a value of 142.04 grams per mole. And overall, that's going to give me a value of 2.94 times 10 to the power of 6 grams. Okay, so let's take a minute um, to figure this out, which is, by the way, we, if we divide by 10 to the power of 6, we'll give us 2.94 tons. Now, we want to be careful about how we're reading this question and whether we're doing extra work that we maybe don't need to do or that we're not interpreting the information correctly. Now, it says, the process produces an industrial-grade sodium sulfate that is 96% sodium sulfate. How many tons of the industrial grade sodium sulfate do we want? So since the industrial grade sodium sulfate is 96% sodium sulfate, and that's what we want, right? What we figured out right now is how many tons of pure sodium sulfate we figured out, we've, we've been able to make. So in other words, what we figured out is if we have this much sodium chloride, we can produce this much pure sodium sulfate. So this is the pure stuff, right? But that's actually not what the question is asking, right? Presumably, there's some contaminants in this process. And so we're actually, you know, this represents 100% pure, right? Um, but we're, we're probably going to actually, if we weighed out the amount of sodium sulfate that would result from this reaction, we would end up with a little bit more because of those impurities, right? Um, and so this, is, this amount right here is 100% of what we would produce from this reaction, um, but um, it's not really representing the amount I would likely measure or that would result from this reaction. So when I say 100%, we need to be careful about that because Yes, it's 100% of what I produce in this reaction, but it's not 100% of, you know, what I will measure. So uh, I'm going to kind of, let's just be careful about that, how we interpret that 100% here, right? I know that what I'm producing is going to be 96% of the whole of what I actually measure. And so what I measure out is going to be 100% of what gets created. And that's going to be heavier due to those impurities. So let me break down how I would work that next step out. So I'm going to get rid of some of this and come back in a second. Okay, so this next step, um, so what I've done is I've taken a screenshot and kind of shrunk the first part of what we did, just so we have those values kind of there in front of us. Um, this next step, which it looks to me actually like I've got two step twos here. So let me just fix that. This should be step three and this would be step four. So my final step here would be step five. Um, all right, and so, um, the, yeah, like I said, this is where students often get tripped up. So I know that the 2.94 tons 
of sodium sulfate is only 96% pure. But I don't want the weight of the 96% pure stuff because when I actually produce my product, I'm going to have the, the impurities that are contributing to it, right? So the last little 4%. So I want to know, I don't want to know 96% what that will weigh. I want to know what 100% of my product will weigh. And so I go ahead and I work this out. And so I've got a value of 3.06 tons. And that is that um, pure, that's not the pure stuff, that's the um, impure uh, industrial grade sodium sulfate. So, you know, that is, you know, that might be a little tough to wrap your head around how we worked out that piece. But just remember that, you know, uh, if you have to visualize it, you're going to have this big maybe reaction vat or whatever. And, you know, you, you're going to produce, um, you know, 96% pure stuff. And then you're going to have a little bit of impure stuff weighed along with that. And so scientists know that on average, when you take um, a sample of sodium sulfate produced from this pro process, that it's going to be a little bit impure. And so you're, you're, you just have to take that into account, knowing how much um, sodium sulfate is actually there, because our stoichiometry won't allow us to predict the impure stuff. It only allows us to know what our theoretical yield, our potential yield of sodium sulfate should be. Um, okay, so I hope that you found that question uh, okay to do. My uh, suggestion to you is to do as many practice problems as you can to get comfortable, mostly with the language of the questions, um, and because the stoichiometry is just one piece of it, but the language in these can often be troubling to students. Um, but uh, please reach out if you have any questions, and I'll be happy to help.